Welcome to this first in a series of Lightroom tutorials I wanted to show you guys. So I thought how would I structure this? I thought the best way to do that is instead of just diving into Lightroom and showing you everything in one go, to break it down piece by piece and focus on Lightroom section by section. So for the first episode, very fitting, I thought we'd focus on the basics, which obviously forms the best foundation for um, your journey in Lightroom. So, this tutorial is aimed at beginners, of course, but as well as um, experienced photographers, because I'm sure there's a thing or two you didn't know yet, or could hone in on just to fine-tune your skills. Now, before we dive into Lightroom, there's something I also wanted to touch on, and that's what you should be doing before you start um, editing your photos, and that's, of course, how to take them. And now there's three considerations I'd really like to point out that really make all the difference before you start editing your photo. First of all, it's imperative that you uh, shoot all your photos in RAW. Why is RAW so important? RAW data files contain a lot more data than JPEG photos, which means with all this extra data, they can be manip manipulated and um, the, the photograph can be shaped in a way that can result in the final photo. A good analogy to compare the two is RAW data is a little bit like the dough and uh, a JPEG file is a little bit like the cake. So the dough you can knead and shape and form, but once you've put it in the oven and taken the, the dough out, it's, it's hard bread, right? and the bread can only crumble and you can't uh, shape it any further. So think about it that way when you shoot your photos. Always shoot in RAW, be able to change them up rather than JPEGs which you have limited um, ability to change in the end. A second thing I want to point out is that it's really important that you expose your photos right in camera. And the easiest way to do this is to look at the um, light meter built into your camera and you'll see a little graph there with zero in the middle pluses on the right side, one, two, three, and minus on the left side, one, two, three. Now, um, as a good rule of thumb, I guess every situation is different, but generally it's good to shoot at minus a third, or maybe minus two thirds of exposure value. Reason being is, this tends to uh, expose the sky really well, which tends to be the brightest part of your image, and you'll end up with the shadows, the darkest part of the image, a little bit underexposed, but that's okay, because when it comes to Lightroom, you gotta remember, you can only um, really brighten photos up. It's not as easy to darken photos if you want to retain all that detail. And the third tip, which is slightly more advanced, is when you review your photos, be sure to look at the histogram. That's a little graph you got in the camera screen. Um, it shows you the exposure value of your photo because the screens can lie. Even your screen has a brightness setting, but the histogram does not lie. And here, the best thing to look out for is each edge of the graph. You want to make sure that that little bar graph is nicely squashed in the middle and in the middle you retain all the detail in the midtones. If you have any of those graphs on either edge of the photo, you're either going to have areas that are completely black in your photo or areas that are completely white in your photo. And that means they're devoid of detail and that detail is gone. It can't be edited. Now, with those three considerations in mind when shooting and you've got your photo and it's well exposed, let's dive into Lightroom and I'll show you guys the basics of editing. And here we are in Lightroom. So this is a photo I took of the shard a few weeks ago from the top of a Tate Modern. And uh, let's look at a few things that I've just mentioned and show you how that translates into Lightroom. So on the right side, you've got that histogram that I was mentioning, the graph. So here is what I was trying to say. Here's the right edge of the highlights, and you can see none of this detail touches that edge. And on the other side of the spectrum, you've got the blacks, the shadows. So I managed to get them just into the graph with none of these actually ending up touching the edge, which means the entire picture from top to bottom, the bright parts and the dark parts, contain all this detail. And we're going to manipulate all this detail into our final picture. Now if you look at the picture, like I mentioned, the sky is well exposed, but the foreground is a bit dark. And let's start editing and changing that. Now um, the basic section which we're focusing on today is right at the top of your Lightroom because it's the first thing you typically tend to edit. And the first thing I want to show you guys is picture profiles. What this means is, this is the way um, Lightroom interprets your raw data and uh, shows it to you guys. And there's various different ways to do this. Adobe Color is the main one, but then you've also got uh, Adobe Monochrome which is black and white and then a bunch of other um, settings. Since this is a landscape photo, landscape obviously uh, lends itself very well to this photo, so we'll switch that into landscape. And then immediately you'll see that the photo uh, became a little bit more saturated, got a lot more contrast, and looks a lot more vivid, which is great for landscapes, 
Um, if you were doing portraits and were editing skin tones, this probably would come on a bit too strong, but in that case there's a portrait mode which we won't be using today. The first thing I like to change when editing is actually as simple as hitting the auto button. Reason being, I find this gives you a very good starting point, and that from there you can tweak it further, customize it, and make it your own, incorporating your own unique style into your photo. Now the first thing I want to talk about is exposure, and that just really is how bright or dark your photo is. And remember at the beginning of the video I said it's always good to underexpose your photos to retain all the details, which means now in post-production we're going to have to increase the exposure a bit just to rebalance the photo again. And right now the photo's on 0 0.61 which leaves good balanced exposure, but that's just the auto settings. So sometimes I feel it's good to tweak it a bit further, make it a bit more brighter, make it a bit more lively, and let's see how that works. So by moving these sliders, you can adjust all the settings. To the left is negative, and to the right is positive. So let's um, boost this a bit further. 0.85 starts to get a bit dark, so let's work with 0.8. Yeah, that looks good. Another thing I want to point out when using the exposure slider is it's always fantastic to use the Alt button and what the Alt button does is, it can show you warning indicators. So if you hold down the Alt button, and then click on the slider, the screen goes black. But now if you move it to the right, you can see when the overexposed bits start to appear in your photo. So let's start doing that. And you can start to see some warning indicators fla flash up. That means, I'll let go quickly, that this photo is completely blown out now, and these sections contain zero detail, just entirely white areas of the photo, and look how that translates into the graph. We've now hit the right edge of the photo, which means all the details lost. So I'm going to hit Command Z, or if you're using a Windows laptop, Control Z, just to undo that to go back to where we were. Step in the editing process involves white balance, and white balance is the way we uh, see white in our photos. Now I always tend to leave the white balance on auto in my camera because it tends to do a good job 90% of the time. But since we were shooting raw anyway, you've got still got full control over your white balance in post-production. So that's why I shoot in auto, because it really doesn't matter at the end of the day. Come in, coming into Lightroom, I've got still got full control over the white balance anyway. Now, um, there's two settings to the white balance. How to make your photo cooler or warmer, as well as more green or more magenta. From a green magenta perspective, I think this photo is very well balanced. But I'll point a flaw out in the, in the warmth of the photo. So if you're looking down here at this construction site, let's zoom in a bit, you can see that this is actually meant to be white, this sheet here, but it's actually looking pretty cool blue, which it shouldn't be. So I think we should warm this photo up a bit, and we do this by moving the slider to the right into the warm area, maybe, yeah, by 500 or so, and already you can see the photo is looking a lot warmer, the white down here is looking a lot more realistic, although it's still looking a tiny bit cool in my personal opinion. But just remember that with white balance, it's not just about making the photo correct. It can also be used creatively. So since this photo is slowly starting to approach a sunset, sometimes it can be good to introduce a bit of warmth into your photo to further accentuate those tones and colors you get coming through during a sunset. Also bear in mind that a lot of people find uh, warm photos more uh, appealing and more pleasing than cold photos. And contrast is the... Um, difference between the light and the dark areas. So if we look at this photo, there's actually a lot of natural contrast already because we've got a lot, very bright sky and very uh, dark shadows in the foreground due to the, the low sun at the end of the day. And as a result, the contrast has been pushed into the negative just to balance the scene out further, which is actually um, something I like. But I'll show you what the opposite end of the spectrum looks like. So if we push this from a negative into a positive, you can see that the difference between light and dark becomes a lot more pronounced. But I think for this specific photo, a negative contrast would be ideal. I wouldn't put it all the way down to minus 31, like the auto had suggested. From a personal pr pr preference, I think uh, minus 18 looks good, because the scene is still looking a lot more balanced, but it's good to introduce a bit of contrast anyway, just to um, add a bit of bite and edge to your photo. Next, let's move on down to the highlights. So the highlights are the brightest area in your photo. So if you look at the graph, it's this area here on the right side of the graph. And what the highlight slider does, it impacts only the brightest areas of your photo. And in this case, that's going to be the sky, predominantly anyway. And 
Um, more often than not, I don't think I've ever pushed the highlights into the positive regions, making the bright even brighter. I tend to um, use the highlight slider to b balance out my scene and make the, uh, the highlights a little bit darker, just to balance the scene out and keep all the detail in the midtones, which is this middle area here on the graph. So I'd, uh, as a word of warning, I wouldn't push them all the way into the extreme, all the way down to minus 100, because your picture starts to look a bit more dull and lackluster. And it's nice to keep a bit of luminance in your photo as well. So after all, photography is the capture of light. And it's nice to have a bit of shine and light and glow into your photo as well. So I don't think minus 65 is even too much already. I tend to not push this past 50 if I can avoid it, just to keep the photo um, looking a lot more live. So at minus 48, the photo already looks a lot more lively, and I'll just leave it at that. Another good thing to point out with the highlight slider is, again, similar to the exposure button, you can hold down the Alt button and slide along it just to um, find out where those warning signs are to see when you've removed the overexposed areas from your photos. So I'll show you that again. Hold down Alt and then start sliding. Picture goes black and in the extreme highlights, you'll see warning signs start to flicker up there. But on the other side of the spectrum, we've got the shadows. And this, of course, is... Um, how to edit the darkest areas of your photo. So that's the left side of the graph and any uh, adjustment we make to our editing is probably only going to affect this area down here which is the darkest part where most of the shadows lie. And opposite to highlights, I tend to not push this into the negative, i.e. making the shadows even stronger, but pushing them into the positive, you're brightening up your shadows and again um, rebalancing your scene and making sure that it's evenly exposed throughout and that all your detail lies in the midtones. So looking at the shadows and this photo, from a personal perspective, I feel that this foreground is still a little bit too dark, so I'd like to increase these shadows a bit. Again, to retain a natural feel, which I think always suits photos best just to make them look the best, I wouldn't overdo this because um, if you push them all the way to 100, I'll show you what that looks like, the photo just looks flat. Perfectly exposed top to bottom, um, no contrast, no change in detail, no light and shadow, and that's kind of boring, to be honest. So I, again, try not to overdo it, and just to scale that back a bit, just to keep a bit more of a natural feel to it. So 59 or so, this does look good and a lot more natural, and like the human eye would also probably perceive the scene. So that's why I think a balanced approach to editing always results in the best photos. Let's chat about the whites and the blacks. Now these are kind of similar to highlights and shadows, and um, Again, from, from a personal perspective, I try to actually accentuate these further. Since, like you'll remember, at first we reduced the contrast. This is a great, great way to bring a bit of contrast back. Make the whites more white and the blacks more black, which gives you um, crisper edges throughout the photo and makes your picture more contrast, has more edge and has a lot more bite to it and looks a lot more appealing. So another great tip, again, is to use the Alt button because here you can see when you've pushed the sliders too far and reached the extremes and that's kind of where I like to stop just to retain that balance and the perfect exposure throughout while introducing the maximum amount of contrast. So if I hold down Alt and push the whites uh, further to the right and to the positive which makes them more extreme see there's the warning signs again at plus 50 so what I would want to do is I'd just scale it back until they disappear right about there and then I'd let go of the slider now the whites are at the maximum and the photo has a lot more white and, and looks a lot more interesting already. Blacks is the opposite again and they become a lot more accentuated when you push them into the negative values. If you were to push them into the positive values, the blacks start to look grey and that just doesn't look nice. So let's get the blacks uh, a little bit more stronger and give them a bit more bite. Again I would want to hold down the Alt button and use the slider and you can see at the bottom of the photo, which was the darkest area of the photo, that the blacks are starting to be reintroduced and are starting to become a bit more stronger. So at minus 39, let's let go. Yeah, and they look a lot stronger already. And now, despite having removed the contrast at the beginning of the uh, editing process, we've now reintroduced it and the photo has a lot more bite, but retained uh, a good balance throughout regardless. Take a look at the final section of the basic panel in the Lightroom Develop module, and that's presence. And this is actually a very powerful um, set of sliders because they can really give your photos a lot more impact. So clarity is pretty self-explanatory and just play around with it and slide around. I tend to push this into a positive value just to give my photo um, 
a lot more presence and make it a lot more stand out at the end of the day. Again, I'd emphasize that restraint is key just to keep your photo looking nice and natural. I tend to not push clarity past 10 or 20 or so just to retain that natural feel while slightly emphasizing the photo to make it really stand out. So let's move it to maybe 15 or so and the photo starts to look a lot better already. What this does from a technical perspective is that it increases the contrast mid-tones, which is this area in the middle of the graph right here, just to accentuate these areas a bit more. The haze again is pretty self-explanatory, it makes the photo a lot more clearer. And this will tend this tends to affect the uh, most hazy parts of the image, which is great just to rebalance the scene and make it a lot more crisper throughout. So now the areas looking at this photo that I'd expect it to emphasize the most is this area here around the horizon where it's starting to look a bit um, pale and hazy, exactly, right? So let's emphasize the dehaze by pushing it into a positive value and this area back here should start to look a lot more clearer. Again, in order to retain a natural look, don't overdo it. I can't stress that enough because that really um, defines the difference between a fake looking photo and a great looking photo. So I'd say no more than 20 in any case just to keep a good feel. So let's leave it at 19 and look at this back here. The clouds are looking a lot stronger and we got the skyline uh, peeking through a lot more clearer as well, which is fantastic. Lastly, we've got vibrance and saturation. And you might be asking yourself, what is the difference between the two? Because both impact the uh, colors you have in your photo. And I'll tell you what the difference is. Vibrance emphasizes the weakest colors in your photos and makes those stronger, i.e. balancing your scene throughout, which is always great when you're editing. And saturation impacts all the photos uniformly. So it's nice to introduce a bit of vibrance into your photo just to make them feel a lot more alive and um, make the colors pop a bit more. But again, keep it natural because that's what is most pleasing to the uh, human eye. I feel like a broken record repeating that, but I do feel very strongly about that. Okay, so we're on 14, which I tend to like, but let's move it around a bit to see what the other options are. If we push it too far, 33, yeah, that starts looking like a colorful rainbow, like a clown vomited on my photo, and I don't want that. So let's um, keep it real, move it back, 17 or so, yeah, that looks very alive. A lot of colorful action going on, which is totally my style, but still looking natural. So that's exactly what I go for my editing process. Saturation. Now, like I said, this impacts the entire uh, photo throughout all the colors, but since we first, remember, introduced the Adobe Landscape mode, I would recommend not to overdo this because our color picture profile already introduced a lot of saturation into the photo and it's already looking very colorful. So let's look at a bit at the extremes. If I push it into the right, colors become a bit too strong. If I push it far to the left, it almost starts to move into black and white. So I guess, um, again, restraint and subtlety is key. So let's move it back to zero and then use that as a starting point. I think for this specific photo, I'd even like to make it negative. So maybe, um, minus two or so, and that's starting to look a lot more natural and very believable. So that's kind of what I go for, and that's what I'll leave it at. And before we end this video, there's one little shortcut that I want to show you guys, and that's the before and after, which you can access by hitting the backslash button on your keyboard. So let's take a look at all the editing we've done already in this tutorial. So this is the after photo, but if I hit the backslash button, there's the before. And look at what a dramatic difference that is while still keeping the picture looking believable and natural. So I'm going to hit the backslash button again, and I'm really happy with the results. Are you? Let me know in the comments below if you've learned something or if there's anything else that you can share with me. I'd love to hear your insights on Lightroom too. And that's it. That's my introduction to the basic panel in Lightroom. I think this is a great foundation for just giving your photos a little bit of edge and just really enhancing what is already there. And then if you're interested in seeing future tutorials where I dive into the other sections of Lightroom, be sure to hit that subscribe button below and you won't be missing out on future episodes. Also, if you're keen to join me behind the scenes as I photograph London and various other cities around the world, this channel is the right one for you. Hit that subscribe button below and I hope to see you in a future video. Lastly, I'd love to grow this community further for you guys and I'd really appreciate your um, engagement on this one. Do drop a thumbs up button below and uh, let me know in the comments below what you'd see me, uh, what you'd like to see me cover in future tutorials and I'll be sure to include that. Well, that's it from me for today and I'll see you soon. Bye for now.